for a lot of people, the heart and soul of America is a lot closer to you know Orlando <laughs> than it is to you know Washington. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rocco Castoro, and this is The Vice Podcast, here today with filmmaker Randy Moore, whose project Escape from Tomorrow has caused a lot of brouhaha uh, about Disney. The film takes place at Disney World. It's a fantasy horror film, at least I think that's what people have tagged it. I don't know if that's what you call it, but how would you describe it? I would say it? that's accurate. Yeah. There, I mean, there are horrific elements, and, and it's, it is a fantasy, so, you know, it goes... Uh, through a bunch of different genres, but uh, I would say a uh, fantastical family romp through <laughs> the happiest place on earth. And it was entirely shot covertly at Disney World, Disneyland? Uh, yeah, we, we shot, we started off in Orlando, we shot there for 11 days, and then we went to uh, Anaheim and shot there for two weeks. Mm. And we did a lot of scouting beforehand, which actually uh, made it into the picture and, and as well as we went back uh, in, in the spring after their Christmas decorations went down and got uh, additional footage. Mm. And uh, the entire film was shot in monochrome? It was. And, uh, and it really was shot in monochrome too because uh, the, the cameras we used, the Canon 5D Mark II, um, we didn't have external monitors otherwise we could have you know shot it in color and then just made the monitor black and white, but uh, due to that limitation, we w wanted to be able to see, you know, what it would look like in, in, on the LCD screen in the back of the camera. So, and and they weren't. I, I don't know if the new ones are, but they didn't have like a raw setting where you know you can go back and change stuff afterwards. So it actually bakes the monochrome image into the media, and and you know you can't go back to color after that. So we committed you know, first day to black and white, which was a scary proposition for some of the actors who didn't really think the film would ever see the light of day to begin with. But uh, when they heard it was going to be done in black and white, we're like, I think maybe ready to, to walk. Oh, yeah. And this was before the artist had come out, too. So there hadn't been a black and white film that had, you know, any notoriety for a long time, really. Well, and I think it's, it's fitting because, one, it makes Disney World, the park, Disneyland, more surreal, taking away the color. And two, it's almost like the film itself, um, I'll try to do a good job of summarizing the storyline, but it is a family yeah. visiting Disney World or Disneyland. It's unclear in the film. Sort of a hybrid. hybrid. I mean, we, we want people to think it's Florida, but you know, obviously yeah. if you've been to the parks, you can tell which ones are which. But it's very, um, you know, they come, he, he, you know, the father gets a call the first day, is there, and is laid off from his job. Um, mm -hmm. So it already, I don't know if he's like, my, if, if, if your father was like my dad, but the last thing he wanted to do was to go and stand in line in Disney World. He did. <laughs> Most dads I see, if, when I have been there since, or any theme parks, they're just like, I want to go to Epcot so I can drink. <laughs> so, uh, so you've got those elements there that everyone really can relate to, or at least most people in America. But um, it almost gets inside of his mind. He's keeping the secret that he just got you know, let go. He mm -hmm. keeps seeing these two young French women, underage French women, who it's you know you're, it's unclear and at least in the beginning if he's kind of pervy out on him. Mm -hmm. um, he's not having a great time with his wife it seems at times and they're dealing with the kids so you've got all these you know undercurrents that you take and then subvert uh, and then it turns into a conspiracy movie on, <laughs> almost uh, I don't want to give away too much but where, where did the first idea for that come I mean obviously Disney World and Disney was a major part of it, but how did you think to kind of write this movie on top of what is a family romp, as you called it? Uh, well, I went there uh, almost religiously with my father as a child. He lived in Orlando, and I, I, my mother lived in Chicago, so I would go, I would fly down and visit him every summer, starting from about the age of three. And it became our ritual going going to the park, uh, and we, we spent a lot of time there and it got to the point where I really as associated him with that park um, you know and that and the park with him too so when I got and 
older and stopped eventually going to the park and, and our relationship sort of fell by the wayside. Uh, it wasn't until I went back with my own kids that all of a sudden, uh, you know, all of these like emotions and complicated feelings I had towards him sort of resurfaced. And, it, you know, those rides can be kind of like time machines because you're, you know, riding the, the same rides you were riding when you were a kid, except, you know, obviously the first, now you have your own kids. But it, I felt like he was sort of haunting me, you know, <laughs> while I was on these rides. And it became a very, like, surreal experience, you know, go, being back in this place that, you know, for me was really, it was like going back to your, I guess, childhood bedroom or so, something mm. like that. And, you know, it, it was really, really strange and, and, sur and surreal again. So that, that was uh, the initial kind of spark. But then uh, on that same trip, when I went back with my wife and kids for the first time, uh, I realized that she, for her, it was a completely different experience than it was for me. She wasn't born in the US, so she didn't grow up going to the parks, and she really wasn't even you know, super familiar with the character. She's from the former Soviet Union, so they have their own characters, I guess. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Their statues are a little different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so she, there was, a, there was a, a moment where we were at this princess fair, and you know, Kids were just screaming and demanding $30 plastic wands from their parents, and everyone was, you know, running around trying to, you know, cater to their kids and give them the best day possible. And just, you know, it was hot and humid. It was August in Florida, which is when there's the most people and the lines are. The, it's the worst time to go, but it's when everyone goes for some reason. And uh, and she turned to me. She's a nurse, and she, sometimes she floats floors at the hospital and she said uh, this is worse than working the psych floor at the hospital and and at first and I was actually angry at first when she said that because I was like what how can you not be having you know a wonderful time we paid to come here and have you know a, a great time and you're not you're not enjoying it so I, I, but then I started thinking about it and and looking at it you know through her eyes and I started to realize like for most of us who grew up and going to these parks and it really is like a rite of passage for so many Americans, like, you know, the trip to Disney or Disneyland. Um, you know, I, I imagine more people probably do it than, you know, go to the nation's capital or whatever. Oh, for it's, sure. Yeah. So uh, that's why I always say, like, those parks have transcended being just, you know, your average theme park. You know, they mean so much more to a lot of people. Um, you know, you could even, for some people, it's like a religious experience going there. Um, but to get back to what I was saying, like I realized when you go on those rides, you're sort of in between two worlds. If you've, if you've had that experience as a child, you're, you're riding them as, as an adult, of course, but you're also remembering, you know, the, it, when, it was, when you were a child. And I think the two play off each other. And so she didn't have that nostalgia from her childhood mm -hmm. to draw on when we were, you know, going, you know, or when we were waiting in line for an hour. Uh, you know, to get on the Jungle Cruise ride or whatever like that, you know, she, or when we were actually even on the ride, you know, she was just riding it from a totally objective, like this is, you know, odd, why, why are the animals all fake and, you know, it was just strange for her. And then I, so I slowly, like, you know, I started to see the crack, you know, the spell wore off of me and I started to see the cracks in the veneer a little bit more and, and, you know, I was looking around and became more of an observer than a tourist. Mm. And then I started going back. It wasn't like right away. I was like, Eureka, I'm going to write my next script here. Um, but I just kept thinking about this and then the time I spent there uh, as a child with my father. And I just almost as an exercise started, uh, you know, writing scenes in, in script form. So that's what I usually write now. And, and slowly, you know, they just, it, it came together. It, it wasn't like I, I even imagined I would ever actually make this movie. And I certainly didn't think anyone else would ever make this movie. But I, it was, you know, just this cathartic writing exercise to sort of get it off my chest. Uh, you know, when I was stuck on other projects, I would always return to this. And then I finished it. I put it away for a while. Um, 
uh, I worked on something else, but it, I kept thinking about this one script, and it wasn't until I was introduced to that camera, the, can the uh, Canon 5D Mark II, that I started thinking, well, maybe there's a way I can, I can make this. And, and it started small. It started me going into the park, or I thought I would go into the park with a few of my friends and just shoot it, just to sort of get back into you know, the swing of directing, because I hadn't directed anything since film school. Mm. Uh, and I thought it would be really you know, easy to do. We you know, had our location, we'd just go in there and, and shoot. Um, you know, and it's a camera that everyone else has too. It's not especially, you know, there's no special modifications or anything like that. It's small, um, you know, it's easy to handle. It, it can be hard to focus because it has a large sensor, so the depth of field is very shallow. So we, focusing was an issue, and it can get a little shaky. But um, aside from that, it produces these images that are so beautiful and cinematic that I thought, this is a way we can make this movie and not make it look like someone's home movie because that was my biggest fear was that it would look like a home video and I can barely watch my own home videos you know with the family that I love going <laughs> to the park let alone watch someone else's home video well and yeah and I think what's interesting about monochrome and it you know at first you almost look at it and you're like wait is this like supposed to be a surveillance camera or something and quickly it becomes apparent that mm -hmm. it's shot with intent and like but at the same time, it's almost like this um, specter is hovering around this family, and especially because things start to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, hallucinations occur. Maybe they aren't hallucinations. You, you're right. not really sure. Um, and it's, it gets back to what you were saying also about kind of childhood. I feel it's like, you know, there's different ways of looking at these things, and the camera in this aspect is, is pretty objective. So. It's 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 getting inside kind of just the minds of the of the subjects of the characters, and then what you find is when you go to Disney World or any theme park, really, if you see kids that are too young to be there to be on the rides, mm -hmm. it freaks them out. They cry. Yeah. You know, and a few years later, then they're filled with joy. And I feel like maybe it reverts when you get a little older too, where you see uh, it's it's scary. I mean, you're, why are, exactly? Why are these animals talking to me? Like, <laughs> why is you know, you know, why is Mr. Toad? So wild, like those kind of things. <laughs> um, it, it, it's I can see that element, but you've tapped on it, and it's obviously got a lot of attention, probably much more than way more you than would think. Ever but and 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 not, you know, as far as I know, nothing negative necessarily from from Disney or anyone. We haven't heard anything from right? Disney yet. And it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm sure someone made the comparison because I got it from somewhere, but. The Streisand effect is that has that's, that, is I, that that's, something you were talking about? Or? I wasn't talking about. Yeah. I, I read, you know, people were mentioning that. Yeah. As, and there's a lot of speculation as to, you know, why they chosen to remain silent on this film, and so I, you know, I, I don't, I don't really have an opinion. I, I, you know, if they want to not say anything, that's great. I don't want to spend years in, you know, mm. litigation. That would be that's the last thing I want to do, and. Well, spe speaking about someone, I mean, the Streisand effect, like, is just so clear. It's the Barbara Streisand had a house, I think it was on the coast of Malibu, beautiful coastline somewhere. Uh, there was a, um, I believe, it was the, pho the photographers doing aerial shots to document the coastline to show erosion, uh, and the, her lawyers demanded, Streisand's lawyers demanded that the images be pulled off. That caused a couple photos that, you know. Ten people had looked at mm -hmm. before that gave her location apparently, but no one would have known that. And then it became a big news story because she decided she's like, I want it down, mm -hmm. which now everyone knows for your houses. So, someone said to me, Look, if Disney were smart, they'd buy it. But obviously, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I hope it does for your sake. But, um, <laughs> it, I guess what I'm saying is like you've, and, and now a malicious way whatsoever is definitely not as. Uh, well, it's a different type of subversion than, than people like um, uh, Paul McCarthy and these people that are really playing with, with Disney's imagery in kind of sordid ways. Um, I guess there's a bit of that there, but I feel like you've kind of nailed like the psychology of the most fucked up American families in this it, movie. Like, is, were you aiming for any of them like that? I mean, I wanted I I wanted it to to actually feel what 
to, to portray on screen what it feels like to go there and have just an awful, awful day, you know? <laughs> and I wanted to, you know, to, to use, you know, surrealism and, and to, to help get you inside the head and not, you know, not just show it, but also actually make the audience, you know, have like an, a, feel like they're inside the characters' heads and seeing what, what they're feeling uh, while, while they were watching the picture. So, um, yeah, that was, that was the intention. What was it like your first day of shooting? I imagine you did some test shoots and you said you did yeah, some scouting. We, we did a lot of scouting and we walked through uh, the whole movie uh, with the camera department about nine times before we ever brought any cast in. Uh, so we, you know, we, we, just us with the cameras, we were pretty comfortable. Um, it was still, you know, it was always, we knew it could, we could be discovered, but um, it, bringing the cast in changed everything. And that, that was ter terrifying the first, the first time we went, went into the park with them. And I had a friend who told me to shoot the hardest scenes first you know, the riskiest scenes, the scenes that were in the most, you know, populated areas. And so the first uh, shot we did is the scene where the family's walking up towards uh, Spaceship Earth, which is the big geodesic sphere uh, in Epcot. And we, it was, a, you know, we had all four actors walking towards this. It, logistically, it was tough. We had the four main actors and the family walking up towards the ball, and behind them we had uh, our cameraman sitting on a wheelchair being pushed, following them, you know, as they approached it. And we also had another family, this sort of like nemesis family uh, coming up from the side. So there was a lot of coordination involved. And, and then, you know, they were all mic'd and this is the first time they were really acting inside the park. And, you know, I always say this was like an experimental movie in the sense that we really didn't know if we could make the movie every day, you know, we didn't know if it was going to be our last day of shooting. So this was the moment when, I, you know, we were all like, can we actually do this now? You know, we knew we could go and film stuff, mm -hmm. but we didn't know if we could then, you know, work with actors in this environment or if the actors could even, you know, m maintain their sanity and, and <laughs> deliver, you know, performances. But like as the lead actor likes to say, uh, you know, when he's interviewed, he's like, I was acting for my life. So I think, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, it really helped their performances because they had to be natural, and, you know, fit in. Mm. And, uh, well, and I mean, you know, it, it, it seems like almost an insurmountable challenge when you think about, okay, we're gonna go shoot this narrative feature in, in, in these real life parks with people all around. And we have to say completely, off the radar or else we're gonna get ejected. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, that sounds like a particularly difficult scene, but there's some other scenes where I'm like, yeah, no, I bet no one was bothering. It just looks like a family, and like no one's paying attention to this insane stuff this guy's saying, or like him looking at that girl's butt, but I bet that happens anyway, you know? Uh, yeah, there were actually a lot of Roy's looking at, you know, the French <laughs> girls when when they were walking around, so it was, it was kind of strange to see, you know, we would say, okay, go there, and, you know, all, dads from all over were, were just, you know, oogling them. So, you know, we felt we tapped into something that, you know, mm -hmm. happens quite often. But, uh, yeah, you know, luckily at the park, cameras are ubiquitous. Everyone has one. You know, we, I think, would have looked out of place if we didn't have a camera with us. So we, did you guys have earpieces or something? Were you communicating? Just we used whispering? our phones. And well, when I communicated with the actors, I would just walk up and subtly, uh, you know, talk to them. And that usually the camera uh, guys would be back here. Uh, they already knew, you know, what the shot was. We had shot lists on our phones too. Every shot in the film was on, on that list and mm -hmm. we got pretty much all our shots. Um, our AD scheduled the, the, the shoot, you know, wonderfully. He was a big Disney fan too, so he probably could have mapped it out, you know, in his head without even going on the location scouts. But uh, he had us run, and we were always chasing the sun, so it wouldn't be like, you know, so we wouldn't be shooting in front of the castle, and it wouldn't be blown up in the background behind us. So he had us running back and forth from, I you know, see. one side of the park to the other end, especially in Orlando, those parks are vast. So Huge. we had to get wheelchairs for the kids. So, 
you know, they wouldn't be, you know, exhausted. exhausted at the end of the day. I think most children probably arrive at Disneyland or Magic Kingdom, uh, and their reactions are, by and large, probably going to be the same the first few times or the first time they experience it. But uh, as adults who bring their children there, um, you've been so many times, you've seen so many park goers. Mm -hmm. Like, is there, is there a common thread that, that runs underneath? Like, do some people not take their kids to Disney and, and it's just this group of people and we don't, we don't see that? Or is it like just everyday Americans like they want everyone to think? It really is. I mean, I, I think if you, really, if you want to see America, <laughs> at, you know, in its... A microcosm. <laughs> it, 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 it's there. Um, you know, it's, there are a lot of large waistbands. Um, there are a lot of people who've just given up on walking all together. Um, and just the, taking and the scooter around. Their legs work, but they've given up on walking. Uh, well, it's, it's easier, right? I guess. Um, you, you see, and you see a whole range of emotions there. I mean, you see the entire, you, know, you see people having the greatest day of, of their life, and you see people just ready to murder each other. And you think, you know, why did they even come? Because mm -hmm. everyone is miserable, you know. People go there with like a war plan, of like we're gonna, you know, hit this ride and this ride and this ride, and we have to, you know, get get to here so we can see the fireworks at night. And if, if, any, if there's any deviation, you know, you can see, you know, just the, the whole family unit falling to pieces and it's, it's sad. Um, I mean, people just want to have, I guess, a great time there and their expectations are so high, you know. And, and sometimes, I'm, I'm, you know, for probably more, more than not, they're met, but a lot of times, you know, yeah. it, do, it doesn't end pretty. Well, I guess like you saw the cracks in the park yeah. kind of through your wife's eyes. It could also reveal the cracks in like a family unit or structure. It does. You know? I, th I mean, it's a hyper reality there and ev everything is like, you know, everyone's ultra sensitive to everything. So, <laughs> you know, the littlest thing will just set off, you know. A mob. Yeah, a mob. And there's something about, you know, going there that, I think is comforting for a lot of people. First of all, obviously, it reminds them of their childhood, and they want to, you know, basically kind of revert back to the, the, the womb or the safety they they had as a child. And uh, and uh, it's it's like it's the ultimate nanny state, you know. What could go wrong there? It's safe. Why go to Europe, you know, and get you know your wallet's stolen when you could go to the International Pavilion at Epcot and hit all those cities in, you know, a few hours. Right? and it's super fast. Yeah. But, I mean, and then you've got, I, 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 when I first read the movie, I didn't know of how much you'd integrate the hotels and the surrounding areas of not just the theme parks, mm -hmm. which has always been the weird thing to me is you get, like, Celebration at Disney right. World, which is a fake, like, I think it's main, defunct now. Is it defunct? I, yeah, um, but... It used that, to be a real was, neighborhood. I yeah. went there, so it, right. that was really interesting. It was, but your movie reminded me. Like I've been there once. It's like you know, it's like Main Street, USA. Yeah. Literally, it's like it's people you know, who wanted to live at Disney World, who like could you know. could, could not get enough and just said, I, I would I want to live there. And there are people like that. One of the strangest things we saw when we were shooting uh, we, early one morning, we we were at Epcot, and there was sort of a, a sweet portly couple that were laying down on, on the ground in front of the geodesic sphere taking a nap and it just and hold like in a full embrace mm -hmm. and people were walking by security no one was stopping them and you, and I don't know if they were on their honeymoon or if they were just in love or just so happy to be in Epcot maybe, but maybe uh, they took some ecstasy or something and, you know, <laughs> possibly mm -hmm. but uh you know, you realize like this is their fantasy come true. They just wanted to lie down in, you know, underneath this, this ball in this in this place because you know it, it meant so much to them. And there's another story about this show called uh, it's it's a fanta it's the name of the show is Fantasmic, and I took my family there and you know Mickey's battling all the Disney villains. And then at one point, he, he sort of disappears and then reappears in his Sorcerer's Apprentice costume at the top of this mountain. And, you know, it happens, you know, at the same time with all these explosions and fire and lasers and music crescendos. 
And uh, when he appeared, there was just this audible gasp through the entire audience, mostly adults, that were, it was like a religious experience for them, as if they were witnessing the second coming. And I was like, this character, you know, this mouse, has taken on so much meaning for these people. You know, these are grown adults. And they were, you could see they had, you know, chills running down their spines when, when this happened. And I was like, wow, this place, you know, it, it's, it's like a corporate religion. How many times did you have to visit the park, all told, from, you know, the, f the first time you were like, we're gonna try to shoot this, uh -huh. to the final scene that you filmed? On average, I mean, I know you're not gonna be able to tell me the exact number. I mean, I, st like, initially it was gonna be me with some friends of mine, and I was gonna shoot it myself, so I, I was, and, and even when I was writing it, I was, I was going with my daughters, uh, you know, sort of, just looking around and trying mm -hmm. to find interesting things. So I would say, I mean, since since I thought about actually making a film there, I probably went there at least 35, Wow, maybe more. And that's just the Magic Kingdom? Times. That's just Orlando? Or is that both combined? That's probably both combined. 35? Yeah. I don't think I could have. So gone that's a total. You've probably been there like... 60, 70 times? Well, just, yeah, during the your lifetime. Oh, in my yeah. lifetime, I'm, I'm probably way more Way than more that. than that? Yeah, because oh. like I said, I mean, my father and I used to, we yeah. just go there every day in the summer. Oh, literally yeah. every day. Oh, Not sorry. every day, okay. but yeah, a well, lot. Jeez, and you didn't, did you have any close calls? Did you get caught ever and by the security? The only close call we had was at the end of the, our park shooting schedule, which was just fortunate for us that it had been scheduled at the end. Um, the actors w w had a scene where it's not in the final cut of the film, but they were, they had to go enter through the turnstiles. And um, if, if we had shot the film sequentially, obviously we would have done this like right, you know, at the top of the, uh, the shooting schedule, but it wasn't, you know, something we thought was, would be an easy shot. So we waited until the end of production to, to grab it and we had them enter and exit and enter and exit uh, about three times, you know, so we could get multiple angles. And after the third time, a personnel, security personnel walked over and asked, you know, why have you just entered and exited the park three times? And the actor said, oh, I think we, I, we forgot our sunscreen or something. And, uh, and then he said, well, do you, are you a celebrity? And he said, no, why, why would you ask that? He's like, because you have paparazzi following you. And, and at that point, I realized they thought our, our camera guys were paparazzi. And initially, when we started filming, I made them shave their beards and dress conservatively. Uh, but I think by this time, it was towards the yeah. end of the shoot, they had sort of you know, gotten re really comfortable and reverted back to their normal like LA film you know, <laughs> attire. So, so they said, well, no, we don't know who those people are. And I think they, they thought something was off yeah. About that, so they said, "Well, come with us." And they pulled them aside, and they took them over to where, like, the firehouse is on Main Street. I said, "Wait here for a second. We're going to check something out." And right when they said that, the kids uh, said they needed to go to the bathroom. And so they said, "All right, take your kids to the bathroom, but when you're done, come right back here." So they went to the bathroom. They took off their sound equipment, and when they came out again, uh, a parade had come by <laughs> as you know, happens every sure. 15 minutes in Disneyland, that basically cut them off from the security personnel waiting on, on the other side of the, of the street. And, and uh, basically, they, my, the lead actress loves to say, they just paraded on out of there with the parade. <laughs> and we had our production van waiting at the entrance. And we got in, and we drove away. Um, and we did like evasive maneuvers through downtown Anaheim in case we had some like unmarked Disney tail to shake. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that was the last day we went into the park with the cast. I, and if it had that, like I said, had that had happened during the beginning of the shoot, I think everyone would have been too freaked out. Yeah. And yeah. The movie wouldn't have uh, happened at all. And how did you cast this? Was it uh, tr traditional in the beginning? It was, yeah, traditional indie film casting. Mm -hmm. uh, we cast both in LA and in New York. Mm -hmm. And no one was like, 
known when you told them and you had selected your final cast, and you're like, actually, or did they know? Like, that was going to be shot? No, no one knew when we right. were just casting. As soon as, you know, someone became, you know, in competition for the role, then we said, look, here's, here's what we're going to do. You know, are, are you on board? And, you know, 99% of the time, they were. They were, yeah. Mm. And um, you came out of Sundance, got a lot of attention when you came out. Did that freak you out in terms of Disney dropping the hammer or didn't know what was going to happen? We didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. We didn't know if we would get, you know, a second screening at Sundance. You know, I, mean, I, I was thinking it was, this projector would be shut down in the middle of the first <laughs> screening, let alone all of our screenings. And Sundance eventually even added a second press and industry screening. So we got all our screenings plus, plus that. So that was amazing. And, um, and then we still didn't really know, you know, what was going to happen for a while. But then we started for the first time uh, betting the film with lawyers. I see. And, and basically, you know, morally I always thought because of the fact that this place, like I said, has transcended being just another theme park and, you know, it means so much to so many people. It's, you know, almost like going there is like going to church for them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that and, and it's you know so much a part of our culture to not be able to comment on it or critique it or parody it just seemed wrong. I felt you know like I, morally you know I should be able to to say this about you know this huge empire uh, that you know that's so ubiquitous and is, is just everywhere in our culture. You can't escape it. Um, but legally, I didn't you know I'm not a lawyer. I didn't crack open law books and start you know seeing what you know, what was I could do and what I couldn't do. And I didn't want to do that either. I didn't want to, like, change the, you know, I wanted to have one pure cut of the film before any uh, legal, you know, people came in and started, you know, chipping Excellent. away at it. Yeah, I didn't want to second guess what, you know, might be acceptable and what might not be acceptable. But, uh, you know, I think... And I also thought, I always felt that the film, you know, should fall under the fair use doctrine as a parody, uh, and I, and we still feel that way. And that's uh, our, our main legal counsel believes that, and basically that's what led us to get E, uh, e &O insurance and, I, you know, grab distri distribution. Uh, and did they make you remove anything that was particularly? We didn't have to remove any Disney things. All we had to do was add a, a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of the film, yeah. And we we cut the film down from the Sundance version mostly for just editorial reasons. By then the picture had been locked for like almost a year and it was kind of a scary prospect to open it up. We would have had to redo a lot of sound design and then we, we actually had a film print uh, of the film that we showed at Sundance, 35 millimeter print. We did a film out in South Korea, which is where we did all our post-production. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so, you know, we would have had to go back and, you know, re reconform, re do another scan out to film. And it was just a, a big, you know, to do. So it wasn't until after Sundance that our sales agent, you know, said, well, since we're going to have to add a disclaimer and, you know, maybe you might want to go in and, you know, chop it down, make, make it sh tighter, which is, you know, because obviously at that point I've been watching it for a year. There were yeah. so many things that I would have loved to have changed. If it was, you know, really easy to do, but then all of a sudden I had the opportunity and I couldn't, and I was so grateful. Did you think you'd actually get distribution? And like, did you think, how, how did you think you might have to screen it when you when you were first, or did you not really care because you made it and that I was thought, enough? Initially, I thought, you know, it was a tiny black and white independent movie. Mm -hmm. I thought it might have a life, you know, in a minor festival circuit. And then after that, I, I thought it'd probably be like driving around in a van, you know, projecting it onto walls with a tip jar, a asking sure. for donations if anyone, you know, enjoyed the film. I thought that was about as far as it would go. Hmm. And the poster is kind of a Mickey hand, right? Or a Mickey glove? It's not Mickey's. It's not whose hand is it? It's right? just, just, just a, a hand. It's just Sorry. A hand. Sorry. The poster is a gloved hand. Yes. It looks cartoonish in a way that many, uh, Cartoons have gloves like that. Right. My, mice sometimes wear them too. I think <laughs> cartoon mice. Uh, but it's uh, you know it's provocative. Um, 
and I think people have written about the poster a lot too. Mm -hmm. And your stance is like, we're not trying to like kind of take the piss out of Disney or anything. And it doesn't. If you're watching the movie, it's not true. It just happens to take place in Disney World, which is a real place, but it's also not. So it's got all these different different levels of things going on. Like, um, were you? It seems like you were really careful to keep it. I don't know if it was secret. Uh, trying to keep it secret from Disney in the pro in the in the uh, post production phase, and you know, it, the fact that they've said nothing uh -huh. is almost spookier than 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 them thinking you're going after them. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps. Get spooked out. Well, I I knew we didn't want to do uh, our VFX and post production like in Burbank. Right. You know, I thought that would definitely be a big mistake. So. When our editor suggested, you know, going to South Korea, where, where she's from and has a, a lot of connections in the film industry, not only did it make like really good financial sense, um, it, it kind of let me s sit down, sit back, and you know, take a deep breath because finally, you know, w we were getting out of LA. Yeah. Um, I kept making backups of, of all the, of the hard drives we w that we had all our footage on because I was just worried that you know. Basically, the, my house was going to be raided. They were going to take everything. Everything yeah. was going to be taken. So it wasn't until like we had hard drives, you know, in South Korea and you know, <laughs> at my DP's house and in my in my closet that I sort of felt a little more relaxed. And um, <laughs> well, that's the thing is that that is another thing that's surprising with the film is, um, in the beginning, you might not think there'd be any sort of visual effects uh, and increasingly there's lots of like I mean CGI I guess or yeah, yeah there's CGI there's a lot of green screen which was we always in, uh, planned on having mm -hmm. green screen um, you know we wanted it to have sort of like this 50s processed shot sure uh, aesthetic to it to add to the black and white but there's just some very uh, modern I guess we'll say filmmaking techniques stuff you might see and maybe in a Disney movie maybe not a cartoon <laughs> but uh Used in different in a variety of ways. Um, I, I just that that surprised me for some reason. I knew it was coming, I guess, but uh -huh. it, it takes it even one step further into some obviously some surreal place. Um, where, like, when the actors had to kind of fake that uh -huh. when the effects weren't happening. I mean, were were any patrons or any fellow guests? Like being like, what the hell's going on? Well, here? most of the big effect shots we did, we shot in uh, on a soundstage, okay. and I do think that it was it was more difficult for the actors to to you know perform uh, on the green screen stages or even exactly. on the sets than when they were in the park because they had you know so much to work off of in the park. So even though, as you know, a filmmaker, it was much easier for me to you know be in that environment and to. You know, have total control over everything, because uh, the park was just you know it was so chaotic. Um, it's the worst you know possible place to make a movie really, but uh, it, it, I felt out the actors were a lot more uh, believable in the park. In the park, yeah. yeah. that makes sense. So, uh, what's your favorite ride at, at Disney World? Or I Disney? like the Spaceship Earth, the ride that's in the geodesic sphere. And I've always liked that since I was a kid. Do you remember the first time you went inside the, inside the ball, inside the dome? Uh, I think so. I mean, I, was, I just remember just having just going. Yeah, going. In. And it's interesting you say that. I mean, did you like Epcot? I did like Epcot a yeah. lot. Yeah. The, the educational park. <laughs> you know, I, I I was never into like the f fairies and the fantasy yeah. land and all that stuff, but I liked that you know vision of the future. That you, Epcot used to be it's sort of a little shabby now, but is, is it they haven't kept up on? I don't. I, they could probably it could use a little updating. Because well, it, it is the future now, and they're like we predicted it. Now. But, um, <laughs> well, that's interesting because I think a lot of kids it's their least favorite park. Uh, I know that, that's what's. I've heard that. Well, it's just it's, so it's kind of impersonal because you don't see like a, their their symbols this giant. Mono, like it's a monolithic, it's almost oppressive, this, this giant ball. It, it is impressive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well thank you yeah, so thank much you. For, for coming in today. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, the mouse and all his friends treat you kindly. I think they will.
They just see the movie. So. Maybe you can do a gorilla screening inside the park. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm into that, but great Thanks. to meet you. Thanks, Rocco.